morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, before starting, I just wanted to uh, give a special thank you for Dylan and the rest of the Hack in the Box staff for uh, having me out here and making me feel uh, extremely welcome. This is a really fun event for me and a good opportunity. So we're going to talk today all about uh, web security, both some of the website side but most of the browser side, and why it is fundamentally broken and how conflicts of interest are preventing certain issues from getting fixed that we'll, uh, that we'll get to. But uh, just a, a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people here have a browser that they use daily? Just a show of hands. OK, and how many of you have a browser feature that broadcasts who you are with every single click to the website? That, that would be the same hands, actually. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go forward. There's lots and lots of broken stuff on the web that we'll go into. But before I get too out of myself with all the live demos and things like that, hopefully the wireless holds in. I've attempted live demos in the past uh, at hacker conferences, and they never uh, went too well, so we'll see what happens today. So uh, what are the rules of web security? There's two rules. The first rule is a website must be able to defend itself against a hostile client, the browser. You know, can you hack in with SQL injection and so on and so forth? And with a lot of work and a lot of effort, it is difficult, but it is impossible to follow. You, I think you can actually make secure websites. What's rule number two? Rule number two is the browser must be able to defend itself against a hostile website. So it works both ways. And I'm of the opinion right now, no matter really what you do really, especially if you're an end user, this is, for all practical matters, impossible. Can't do it. I get uh, asked all the time you know, by reporters and analysts and enterprises, you know, how do we see browser stuff? And I really don't have a good answer, uh, good answer for them. So I'm going to talk a lot about this particular area. And so I'm going to talk about the, the second half of web security, the security of the browser. And just to give you the lay of the land, and I'll prove it to you as we go forward, right now, any website you visit, the website gets passive access to the information about your operating system your various system settings, your browser type, all the installed add-ons and plugins that you have, your geographic location, the websites you're currently logged into, and so on and so forth. It's very, very easy to glean this information right at the moment you visit a website, and it doesn't matter uh, your patch model. If you give that website just one more click, you give it access to your, uh, your full name, where you live, places that you've been, the town you grew up in, went to school, your marital status, probably your online photos, and in some cases, your browser's autocomplete data and surfing history. Lots and lots of information. That's the passive stuff, the stuff that trends on where the website owner is still probably doing things that are legal. The browser can then be made to do many, many other things. The, br the website can force your browser to make self-incriminating web requests. It could force you to hack other websites or download malicious content. It can force your browser to hack the internet websites of your enterprise or your home's uh, internal router, um, and all sorts of nasty stuff. So the browser out there is, is, a, is a hacker's platform. It's a paradise in the browser. So let's divide this browser up into two types of attack techniques, types of goals, rather, because they sort of get lost in the shuffle. Um, the first attack technique are the attacks that are designed to escape the browser walls. You know, and you know, to escape the browser walls and infect the operating uh, system below, the so-called drive-by downloads. And uh, this is, you know, whether it's Windows or Mac OS, it's all the same. And uh, this is where you see on the board out there for the, uh, the Ponyam competition where the guys from uh, Pinkie Pie play to exploit the browser and land on top. And over the last, you know, five years or so, there's been a lot of emphasis, a lot of new security features designed to prevent this scenario from, from happening. You have sandboxing, silent uh, updates, uh, increased software security in general, anti-phishing updates, and the list goes on. And these are all really cool because they're enabled by default. You get them for free and the user doesn't have to do anything new. Then there's the other web attacks. There's the ones that go outside the browser walls. Uh, this is where I tend to play with, with attacks such as cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, clickjacking, and a billion other variants, where they're quite content to stay within the browser port and the data that is in the cloud. You know, from a bad guy's standpoint, if the data that you're after, the email addresses, the user's name, their bank account details, if it's all in the browser walls, I pref prefer to stay there. The security features that go after these, uh, these attack techniques are secure cookies, you know, the secure flag on cookies, HTTP only, 
X-Frame options, strict transport security, X-Content type, and a whole bunch of other security-related headers. The problem with these is, is that they are opt-in by the website owner. For the user to benefit, the website must opt-in. And most of the time, they don't opt-in. So they don't really provide ways for the users to protect themselves, which is rule number two. Must be able to defend yourself. These don't help with that. Most, all the attack techniques I'm gonna share with you today share one common theme. They actually leverage a very basic use case. Uh, you know, how the web was designed from the very beginning. Let's say you have a, an image tag, you know, just a basic image tag that points, you go to a, some website, whatever the website is, and you go image source equals some other website. Your browser will be, then make a web request to get this particular image. If all things uh, work, you'll get an image on the screen. You can also detect if the image loads successfully or not with a little bit of JavaScript. You have on load and you have on error. If the image loaded successfully, the on load event handler will fire. In this case, the function successful will error. If the, if the image, for whatever reason, was broken, the on error event handler will fire. The error function will execute. That's, is the, that's the technology. That's the feature that's baked in the RFC specs, uh, specs that we'll use to do login detection in the browser. And this is understood. There's all different ways to do login detection, so I'm gonna show you just one quick way on how to do it with image tags. Uh, let's say there's a website out there, some other website, imagine it's you know, like a file sharing portal or something like that, and it has an image on that website that is only viewable, only requestable if the browser or the user is logged in in this scenario. So you, you go to a, some malicious website and it points that image, it has a little bit of HTML code that points toward that image, and it does the onload, uh, on error event handler trick. If the image returns successfully, meaning that you are logged in, the bad guy can know it, and if it's not logged in, they, the image will return or not return uh, correctly, and you'll get you know, the on air event handler of fire. Very, very easy. All you have to do is just find one resource on the target website, one little image that only responds uh, if the user is logged in. There's five different ways that you can do this sort of trick with uh, JavaScript, with cascading style sheets, uh, with iframes, and so on and so forth, but it's a very simple trick. I'd like to actually uh, show you that method and uh, several with it uh, live, actually. Let me bring up my screen here. So my browser here is logged into a few websites. So this is live, so hopefully it'll work. Right, this is my Facebook account, my Twitter account, I'm logged in, I'm logged into Yahoo. I'm not logged into Google, just to show difference. I'm logged into Amazon and also LinkedIn. Now, this page I'm on right here is just a web server on the local box here. It could be any website out there, I just called the host name Hacker. And I'm gonna hit reload on this page to load the, uh, the proof of concept so you can see it load on the fly. So it's loading right now and I should probably I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna load it one more time, but I'm gonna show you the developer tools. Right here. So let me hit reload again, you'll see this. So my browser is being forced to make all kinds of cross-domain web requests, and depending on how the website responds, it tells the hacker website whether or not I'm logged in. So if you, we browse down here, you'll see my, it's my browser's been detected as logged into Yahoo, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, and LinkedIn. This proof of concept code supports all these particular sites, seven and all, and currently supports all, uh, all modern browsers, all the major browsers, except one little caveat due to some technology limitations. I wasn't able to do a login detection uh, on Internet Explorer 8 and 9 for Yahoo, but the rest works just fine. So it's really fast, really easy, for any website to tell what other pages that you are logged into. And this is really, really useful um, for follow-on attacks. So we, it should, uh, we should remind ourselves that when you go to a website, they'll know, you know what browser you're using, uh, the technologies in use, and all sorts of things. So now we know, if you're the bad guy, you know what sites the user is logged into. But this user is still generally anonymous. So we want to know what that person's name is. And this is what I mentioned earlier before. We're going to do de-anonymization, figure out who the user is with one click. And we're going to use us, uh, 
an attack technique called click jacking and a variation uh, called uh, follow jacking and like jacking. So there's many, many websites out there, particularly the social networks that have these little third party widgets, uh, Facebook like buttons, right? You've probably seen them on third party web pages, the little you know, follow buttons for Twitter and plus one and everybody has one. There's probably like every social, major social network has one. So all that has to happen is you have to convince the user to click for more dancing cats or whatever it is. And if they mistakenly click on one of these buttons here, that actually will send a request to the bad guy that they can detect who the user is. So the user is going to mistakenly click on one of these buttons that the bad guy sets up. Uh, before we move there, I'd just like to give a quote there from a you know, quote that I really like. The mashup is a self-inflicted cross-site scripting attack, which is effectively what we're doing here with these buttons. So let me uh, set this up for you here. We're going to do it uh, first very simply with, uh, let's say, with Twitter. Now we're going to the Twitter page. So my browser is obviously logged into Twitter. And see this little button here that's following my mouse around the screen? The only reason that's visible is because we make it visible. So we're, right now, we're going to be tricked into following Tommy Chai 67. So, you know, whatever there is a link on the screen or whatever. Now, before I click this, I'm going to go to Tommy Chai's account and look at his followers, right? So you see the not tricks up there? I'm going to hit reload. So the way Twitter works is the most recent follower is listed at the top, OK? Now watch what happens here when I click. I'm going to click. I won't see this if I'm the victim, OK? And then by some magic behind the scenes, which I'll get to, the website was able to determine my name, my username on Twitter, where I'm from, my, and everything in the Twitter profile. One click. You wouldn't see this in a normal live scenario. The mechanism that this works is actually once the click happens, the bad guy goes and looks at the, the Twitter account's profile and sees who's the most recent follower after the click. So you notice that I'm on top. It's very, very trivial to actually do one click de-anonymization. Does that make sense how that works? I hope so. Right. Facebook is a little bit trickier because we can do this on Facebook as well. So to show you how it works on Facebook, I have to show you a different Facebook account, different browser that'll be logged in differently. So this is a, a Facebook account I called White Hat Doorman. And it has a whole bunch of Facebook pages here, all de-anonymizer names. These are just very special Facebook pages because the bad guy must control the page that the user will eventually like. Okay? So we'll keep that in mind. We'll go to the Facebook page and we'll hit reload. Hopefully, we get a like button to pop up. Doesn't want to pop up. That's just great. Oh, here we go. OK. So now, same as before, we got this little like button here that we're going to mistakenly click on if we're the user again. If we're the real victim, we wouldn't see this. Now, if you notice here, the de-anonymizer 9, that's a randomly selected page at the bad guy, Facebook page that the bad guy controls. There's no like on it right now. So now, the user will click on it, and that's it. They have been de-anonymized. It takes a minute for the back-end code to load. So as that comes up, I'll show you. Back-end here, what was it, de-anonymizer 9? So notice that 19 seconds ago, Jeremiah Grossman logged, you know, liked de-anonymizer 9. Bad guy can check this because they own the page. And since they know who liked the page, they can go view my public profile and extract all the information that they want with a single click. So now this is why you notice over here. It has ripped out all the uh, personal pictures on my Facebook profile, uh, my, my name, my native language, my Facebook username, my last name, my Facebook ID, everything that they want that's public on it. But one click on a like button, that's all it really takes to de-anonymize. So, careful what you click on, right? So now we know a lot about the person's browser. We know where they're logged in. And with that, we use that, we use that information 
uh, to de-anonymize the user. Now we know their real name. So this is where uh, I come into the picture, basically saying, unless you've taken very particular precautions, please assume that every single website you know, know, visit knows exactly who you are, where you are from, and so on and so forth. So that's the thing, some, some of the things that we know of today. There's also other ways that we can do uh, different forms of employee detection or even internet hacking. Let, let's say we wanted to know, now we know who the person's name, we may or may not know where they work. But let's say we want to know where they work. This is where we use something from, uh, you know, from a several years ago, the browser internet hacking stuff. So as we sit on our corporate networks, or our home, you know, mostly our corporate networks, right, your browser sits on the, the local DMZ, not really DMZ, just the local internet, and your browser can connect to internal corporate resources that the bad guy isn't uh, necessarily able to reach externally. So the user, you, goes out to visit a web page, you grab the JavaScript malware, and it executes here behind the firewall and your browser can then connect to all these different places. So many corporations have internal HR portals, common names, uh, bug tracking systems, you know, that the bad guy can know about ahead of time. I have found them on Google, at Yahoo, and all sorts of things. So now when you come to my website, I give you an iframe. iframe equals in some internal resource, some internal host name that only you can get to. If that page loads successfully, I pop an onload and know you're an employee of that particular company. And if I so desire, you can actually force the user's browser to start hacking those websites with impunity because now you're effectively behind the firewall. This is unfixed today. It's unclear if this will be fixed ever. So let's start wiring some of these things together, okay? Uh, more of a larger demo. I put this up. I didn't have time to put up the live demo, so you have to uh, live with a, a local demo. <laughs> so this up here. So I've shown you all these pages, how I'm logged into all these things. So this is an internal website here in this box, but it would make no difference on whether or not it uh, was hosted, hosted remotely on the public internet or on my box here. I'll make this, all this code available. So this is on the hacker's website. And again, we're going to click jack the user. We're going to click jack Dylan's account. We can use any account that we want. And then we're going to mistakenly click the follow button. That gives us a little bit of information about the user. And then the button disappears. And we're gonna click that, jack the user again on the like button, and that will disappear. Two clicks and we get a lot of information about the user. So now the rest is just, you know, aesthetics, really. So if you want to find information and show the user what you have, I'll say, hello, Jeremiah Grossman, blah, blah, blah. This is what I know about your uh, know about you. I know your name, and I see your profile with a single with a single click. If you want to know about their computer, no problem. The browser provides great JavaScript APIs to tell that I'm running an Intel Mac OS right here, uh, operating system version uh, 10.7.5, and I'm not virtualized. It's a very interesting way to detect virtualization on a public website using the screen dimensions. My, my uh, computer right now is running 1680 by 1050, but screen dimensions are fairly standard, right, across all laptops and computers. If you're virtualized, you're in like a VMware window or a VMware Fusion window, and the window is kind of elongated in different ways and it's non-standard. If, if you notice that the browser is a non-standard size, you can actually detect the virtualization state just by the screen dimensions. Uh, I'm the, it's able to detect, this is very easy stuff, you know this. The browser is a Chrome, you know, 22, Websites can detect it all day long from the user agent. Uh, my language, uh, if ActiveX is available, since I'm running Chrome right now, it's not, but if it was IE on Windows, it would be. 24 bits of color depth. And there's also another trick, uh, which I don't have the time to show, where you can actually detect the default browser if the user is running IE. So let's move down a little bit and see some other stuff. Browser plugins. So browser plugins are different than add-ons. Browser plugins are things like Flash and PDF Reader, where the browser wants to display rich content in line, stuff other than HTML and JavaScript. And so these plugins that the browser supports can be seen. And you know, this is fairly common stuff. Right now, my, my browser has 13 different plugins that are available, everything from QuickTime to Flash, Silverlight, you know, Google Talk, all sorts of things, you know, SharePoint and so on and so forth. So this is great for, sec for second stage exploitation or just basic fingerprinting because a lot of times 
while everybody might be running, you know, a lot of people might be running Chrome, they might have a different set of plugins. Plugins. Browser add-ons are different. Uh, in Chrome, they're called uh, in Chrome they're called extensions. In Firefox, they're called add-ons. Add-ons actually are different than plugins because they extend the functionality of the browser rather than just read content. They'll improve the user experience. As I run this, I actually what I'd like to do here is show you the developer tools and show you how this works on the fly. So I'm gonna declassify here. And it actually detected that I'm running ad block and web developer tools. The way this works is, is uh, in, it doesn't, uh, the, this technique, there's a similar technique that worked in Firefox, but it doesn't anymore, but it works fine in Chrome. You see all these Chrome extension URLs here? If you go to the Chrome uh, add-on repository where all the Chrome add-ons uh, are, Every add-on gets, gets a custom ID, this long you know, string of letters and numbers here, and they're all different. And you can mine them all out, so I, I mine the top several thousand of them out. And then every, and th so this URL points locally, so you point to the ID of the extension to check, and the manifest.json file, which is just a, a whole bunch of JSON data that comes back in the browser. So I go script source equals that URL. If it fires the onload event handler, I know you have that extension. So it's kind of a brute force exhaustive way to search for what extensions are available in the browser. So it's you know, quite helpful. So you can see all the, all the checks I do in a few seconds. A few seconds you can do thousands and thousands of requests. Next thing we can do, we can do some IP geolocation stuff and I'll, I'll light this up. Now, Everybody knows that, you know, you, you, you know, unless you're proxied, you display your IP address uh, to every website that you visit. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that IPs can contain lots of helpful information depending on who registered them with. It'll tell you your ISP, your general geographic location, sometimes your coordinates. So right now, the system was able to detect uh, my current IP external to the system, which is the 211 number there. But it was actually able to detect uh, that I'm in Malaysia and give a nice scary map to the user. So it kind of gives a nice idea of the type of user that you're, that you're looking at. Now we get to some of the even more scary stuff. So I, yeah, I did, we did the clickjacking attacks earlier, right? So all this personal information is there, so let's declassify it. So right, this is the information that I was able to glean from both Twitter and Facebook. We could have done the same thing on LinkedIn and Google Plus and all those sorts of things. Uh, in the US, it might actually work here, I don't know. Um, if you have the person's name and location, you can do what's called a Spokio search. So I hotwired that in, it's a simple click, and you can actually f start finding all the Jeremiah Grossman's in different places out there, and I've already revealed that I'm from Silicon Valley, right? So this is where I'm from over here. And you can start seeing different places where I might have lived. This sucks. Sucks because it's correct. Then it's also able to get the photos and different things. Uh, down here, we saw that. All the photos we saw. So this is kind of like the, the super proof of concept page, right? That kind of brings together a whole bunch of web hacking tricks, all the pages that I'm currently, all the sites that I'm currently logged to, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see it gets, you know, from a browser security and privacy standpoint, they're, it's, a little, it's a little odd out there. All right, let's go back to some slides. So, now that you've seen this, when we start seeing headlines that read like this, Chrome is the most secure of the top three browsers, or maybe it's Internet Explorer, we can kind of see what, with context, what, how secure browsers are, and what they can and can't protect against. You know, I think it actually looks more like this, but that's just me. So I get asked all the time, what are the possible solutions out there for the users or what the browser vendors can do? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of the possible solutions to start taking care of some of these problems. And the, there's many, many ways we can brainstorm around this, but let's say we wanted to fix login detection. One way, and I'm not advocating for this, but one way is we can decide 
where the browser can decide not to send web visitors cookies to off-domain destinations different from the host name in the URL bar, along with those web requests. So what does that mean? That means if you're on hackers, the hacker website or the third-party website, and it loads in a Facebook like button, the Facebook wouldn't get your fa logged in Facebook cookies. So Facebook wouldn't know who you are. So there would be none of that cross-domain cookie stuff, no cross-domain authentication. So you could do that. The side effect is that it, quote unquote, breaks the web. Not sending cookies off domain would break websites using multiple host names to deliver authenticated content. It would break single uh, click widgets like Twitter follow buttons and Facebook like buttons because we really like those. And it also breaks Google tracking via Google Analytics core metrics and things like that. So given how, the bra how browsers and browser vendors make money, this is a complete non-starter. So it's not the only way to fix login detection, but it's just shows you the, 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 the logical process on how we look at these things. Let's say we wanted to fix de-anonymization. To fix de-anonymization the way I described it, you have to fix clickjacking. One way you could, you could do it is you can ban iframes entirely, or at least ban transparent iframes. So I think, ideally, the browser users should be able to see what they are actually clicking on. Here's the problem. It breaks the web. Millions of websites currently rely on iframes, including transparent iframes for essential functionality. Notable examples, but you don't really notice it, are Facebook, Gmail, and Yahoo Mail. Transparent iframes are used throughout these particular things, so breaking that functionality would break those services, and the users and the browser vendors would not like that very much. So that is a complete non-starter, too. So we live with that risk. How about uh, browser intranet hacking, because that's also not fixed. We could create a barrier in the browser between the public and private networks by prohibiting the inclusion of RFC 1918 content on non-RFC 1918 websites. What do I mean by that? That means if I'm on a public website, let's say my evil blog, I cannot force your browser to make passive requests to internal IP address space as defined by RFC. Let's just break that. I thought that was a fine idea. I've been told otherwise. I've been told by the browser vendors that some organizations actually do include intranet content on public websites for their for their employees, and here's the bottom line. It does not violate RFC standards. This is okay from an RFC standpoint. A public website can legitimately call private content from private IP space. So vulnerabilities are actually required by, uh, by web standard. So these, particularly the last one, are known won't fix issues. So what that means is, let's just say the intranet hacking ones, our intranet websites are unsafe, our browsers can be launch platforms for intranet attacks, and you know, before I wasn't you know, too sure about this particular attack if it was a, a real threat, but in the last uh, week leading up to Hack in the Box, we actually saw a variant of this attack deployed, I believe in Brazil, where a few million, a uh, couple million intranet DSL routers were compromised using this particular attack. So it is a, a real and growing threat. So, but because there is some breakage in this, these particular fixes by making that barrier out there, because somebody has, imagine this, there's a company out there that you've never heard of, you don't know their name, you don't, really don't know their use case, and you'll never go to their websites. Because the browser vendors need to support them, the rest of us have to be, our intranets have to be kept insecure. It's a really weird scenario. But to appreciate it, you must look at it from their perspective, okay? Their choice is simple. You, have to be, you can be less secure and more user adopted, or you can be secure and obscure. Because think about it. If they were to break that intranet functionality and it was even just 1% of the user base, all those business users would then just transfer to another browser and they'd lose 1% market share. Sure, the other 99% would be nice, but the browser vendors would lose out. So you have to see it from their perspective. So it's all about market share. It's all about trench warfare. Every little feature, every little thing that they do for security or against security must improve market share or they won't do it. That, and that breakage is critical to that. And uh, I'm constantly reminded of this fact by, by Dan Kaminsky. He actually sent this tweet to me uh, a while back. Uh, Nobody's breaking the web, dude. Not now and not ever. And so far, he's been right. So what happens is, in the, in the browser security space, because we can't fix these things by default, we instead get these secure flags, these little point solutions, and there's you know, dozens of them to solve incremental problems that are all opt-in. So we get secure flags because in the beginning, uh, we sent cookies, you know, you know, cookies that were 
created over SSL, we could force the browser to send them over non-SSL. So then we got secure flags. We got HTTP only for cross-site scripting attacks so they couldn't access the cookie data. We got X-Frame options for opt-in security on clickjacking so certain pages could say, I don't want to be iframed. And that helped to an extent in, until a page like a Facebook like button needed to be iframed. We had strict transport security, X content options, content security policy. We are littered in these point solutions that are all opt-in by website owners. They have measurably low adoption rates and do not allow the user to protect themselves. That's where we're currently at. So I feel pretty confident that web browsers are not safe they are not secure, and they do not adequately protect your privacy. So this is kind of a way to uh, articulate it. Does anybody want to disagree? Does anybody want to run their browser into a website that I control, especially one in default mode? So what do we do now? I talk to browser vendors all the time, and usually I cause them much angst, but I guess that's part of the job. So the status quo, you know, one option is the status quo. We keep doing what, we, uh, what we've been doing, and we kind of inch the bar forward a little bit, but right now it's just not very good out there. Um, the other one, which is kind of an interesting model that I've been following closely, it's called dot secure. Uh, you ever, how many here have heard the dot secure TLD idea where the new TLDs come out, and there's gonna be a dot secure, it's gonna be the more secure web. Um, go check this out, it's gonna be an interesting idea where the, the registrar of the TLD is gonna have a certain benchmark for inclusion. So if you want to register company X dot secure rather than dot com, you have to meet a certain security bar. I don't know what the bar is and I don't know how they're gonna audit it. But it's kind of a way to start over, you know, so we don't have all these problems on the next generation of secure web. So what happens is we're gonna have this new arguably secure web, but then we transfer this legacy problem to an adoption problem. Now we somehow have to convince all the major corporations and all the website owners to move over to the new secure system. Or third, we can break the web. And so far, no one's been really willing to do it. So in which case, we have a, another model, which I've been looking at closely, because I get asked all the time, uh, well, what browser do you use? So I guess I'll take a moment to talk about that. So uh, one of the things I, I do for my friends and family and my mom and dad and all that sorts of things, right? I give them two web browsers. I give them their everyday web browser and then their banking social networking browser or something like that. So I say, you use this browser only to do your promiscuous browsing. You know, I loaded up as much security stuff as they can tolerate and they visit news websites and all sorts of things. But they, I ask them to never, ever, ever log in using that browser, not to your web bank, not to Facebook, nothing. It's just for passive clicking around clicking on stuff, people send you an email, and things like that. When you want to do something important, I give them a secondary browser. You know, it could be any, any one of them out there. It could be Chrome, Firefox, or whatever. And that's the one I give them their bookmark for web banking, you know, social networking, or whatever. They go to that site, so they have two browser windows open, open, they go to that site, do their business, and they log out or close the browser or whatever. What that does is if the promiscuous browser hits a evil blog page or something like that and tries to pull off one of the hacks that I mentioned here, it's not going to work because that browser has never been to those particular web pages. So I've achieved isolation. I've broken the web in terms of application isolation. The, you know, you can't hack my parents on their banking website from evil blog because, you know, that browser has never been there. So what I've been experimenting with uh, in the last... I guess, you know, several months is something a little bit more evolved than that. I've actually, it's not a, something I can advocate for anybody else because it, it's, it's really hard. So I take uh, copies of, I, I download my own version of Chromium and I modify all the code internally to, you know, break the web and do the things that I find that are important. I compile my own version. So when people ask what browser I use, I usually either lie and say Chrome or Firefox or I say mine and they kind of look at me weird. But this is a move towards this particular scenario here. So if you notice on the mobile applications here, the things that we use on our little phones, all these little apps here, most of them are just little mini web browsers. You know, they look at little mini websites on, on PayPal and, you know, and Discover. Yeah. They're just mini websites. These are functions of little mini isolated browsers. So if you were to log in 
using this mini browser on PayPal, and you close this down and you launch the AT&T My Wireless, they don't have these click jacking problems. They don't have cross-site scripting problems. They don't have any of the cross-site problems because there is no cross-site. The sessions are isolated here. So I was thinking, okay, that's pretty interesting. We've broken the web that way on the, uh, on the app store. Maybe we can do the same thing on the desktop. So I've been experimenting on my local box here. So I actually make uh, versions of browsers for, for Facebook. I have a Chromium-based browser that is, has connection controls built in that only goes to Facebook. So if I want to do something on Facebook or LinkedIn or Gmail or whatever, I launch that particular browser. It just automatically goes there. It's automatically logged in and locked down you know, the way I think it should be locked down. So I have these, all these little icons on the desktop. So maybe, just maybe, a way to get around the, uh, the web security breakage out there is to, for the desktop model, for desktops to adopt the mobile app model. So you have multiple browsers on the desktop that are not really browsers, that's just many web apps that just happen to transfer HTML and you do it that way. So you can still have your, you know, your, your Chrome browser to do your promiscuous surfing, but anything quote unquote important, anything you don't want to get hacked, it goes through one of these desktop apps, you adopt a similar model out there. I don't know if that'll work. I'm not in the browser space, I don't make money when browsers are sold, but it's a, a way for me to achieve safety uh, in my personal life, but I also give these versions of, my br of browsers uh, to my friends and family to experiment with and to mess around with, and it seems to be working pretty good. So I am way early on time, does, and I probably sped through other areas faster than I should. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. would be banks, because banks around the world have this internet banking thing, and you, know, you, you include PayPal and any other money transaction websites, and they're highly regulated, and they go through all sorts of things to, uh, to claim they're secure just to make people safe. Like, uh, like the Singapore government, for example, has mandated the banks have tokens, and you know, so you have two-tier authentication, three-tier, the only thing you've done is inconvenience the user. But I think, Tell me if I'm wrong. Banks will take a long time to do this because they simply don't have the know-how or the, there's not enough of you in the world to, for them to employ to write um, dedicated PC screen um, app, mini apps. I think, I think this is a good idea. I do not know if Windows 8 with the tile thing is trying to go in that direction. I, I, don't, uh, it's, I, I, think the banks and the, I think the banks at the very least might be interested in this particular model here. I don't know for sure, but I think you're right. They probably don't have the skills to write the software, to manage it, to deploy it, and support it, and all that, all that sort of thing. But what I also think is uh, one of the challenges to adoption in the banking model is that uh, it has to do more than security. It has to provide performance and ease of use at the same time, because security, as I've come to understand, is not enough to do something. But what, what I found is interesting, because I've been, again, playing around with it locally, is if you control the website and the technology underneath, all the load balancers and things like that, and you control the client and all the lo local storage and all the caching, you can cheat on performance. You can pre-cache and pre-download everything locally, and you get performance gains that would never fly on a regular generic browser. So you can do performance gains like that, and also, you know, uh, what else can you do? Uh, one of the other things I was thinking about in this model, and I'm not in this business, I don't know, I just conjecture, um, is that uh, if you're, let's say, Intuit, right? Intuit makes Quicken. They make three versions of Quicken. They make Quicken for Windows, Quicken for Mac, and they also make online Quicken. So they have three different dev teams, three different QA environments to support three different platforms for effectively the same product. One way this model might solve a lot of people's pain is that you decide not to develop the, the OS 10 and the Windows-based versions anymore, you just build the online ones, and what you sell as, let's say, Quicken in our example, is actually a desktop browser that automatically goes to their website, and you do all your business there. So you get one dev team instead of three, building for one platform instead of three, the web, and you get, you know, so you get cost savings and security at the same time. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> So maybe, just maybe, but we're kind of at the infancy of this kind of thing. You know, web technologies are still a little unstable. So we'll see, but maybe. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I would like to know, hi, uh, I would like to know uh, how much does like uh, private browsing protect us on, you know, some of the browsers have that uh, feature, uh, i.e. Firefox, 
to, sure. to, pro, to do private browsing? Uh, so we probably could have tested it. <laughs> um, but I think so private browsing mode, the, the major thing it does is when you close the browser, all the cookie and cache stuff is deleted. But a lot of times what happens is people, let's say private browsing is the same thing as Tor. You'll be in private browsing or you'll use Tor, and then you'll log into Facebook, which then boggles the mind. <laughs> so it probably won't defend against a whole lot. What it would defend against probably is persistence. So one of the things I didn't talk about, but I probably should, is uh, how many here have heard of Evercookies? Evercookies? So, so uh, for those unfamiliar, that so you know the regular cookies where you can store website, can, can store uh, client-side data, you know, in a cookie file. But there's actually 12 different places in the browser that I'm aware of where you can store cookie-like data. So if you try to delete your cookies, it's not exactly going to work. So. One of the things is, let's say you're in private browsing mode and you store, you get all this information and you store the user's cookie in private mode. Once they close the browser, you would lose that data forever. So even if the hacks got fixed, you could still know who the user was over time. And that's what's really problematic about these particular techniques is I don't think I'm presenting anything particularly new from a technological standpoint. All these attacks are new. I mean, all these attacks are well documented. I'm just wiring together that I think rather cleverly. So let's say somebody already did this. You know, somebody already did all these things and they cookied everybody and they know who everybody is and now they don't have to run the hacks out there anymore. So private browsing mode would help you in this case because we don't know what the bad guys already did. Does that make sense? So now we just, you know, gotta constantly clean up the cookies and make the bad guys, you know, lose their data over time so they can't track us anymore. That's why also fingerprinting is kind of important. So, so to answer your question in kind of in brief terms, if, if if you run your private browsing mode browser and you're logged into Facebook into my demos, then it's not going to help that much. Any more questions? All right, so uh, all the code, uh, next week I just ran out of time, so all the, yeah, I'll, I'll send uh, Dylan and the ha Hack in the Box guys all the slides. Uh, if you want the code, I haven't got a chance to build them anywhere, but if you want the code, just uh, send me an email and I'm happy to share with you all the code. I'm not trying to hide anything, you can have it all. Uh, all well documented. So in the meantime, thank you very much for your time. Hopefully it was interesting. Thank you, Jeremiah. We still have 15 minutes for questions, so if you, ah, I see one question popping up. Uh, I think the main problem is the desktop application. We still go back to the old classic model where the application can be reverse engineered, and then how to make sure that that application have not been tampered. How you, uh, it's very challenging for like banks to actually make sure that the things that they, they put it to customer to download, all those things, uh, how do you manage ensure that th those things are secure and not tampered? Sure. Like today we have all those marketplace, and then we have all those alternative marketplace, which also can, uh, put the something uh, very like genuine application in there. If customers are driven to those marketplace and download, you have the same problem again. Sure. So I think the, the basis of the question is uh, we're going to be downloading malicious apps and how do you prevent, how do you ensure that the malicious app on the user side is not tampered with in some malicious way? And I agree with you that it is very challenging and I think we should stop trying. I am not hip to antivirus. So rather than banks trying to authenticate the person or validate the app as untampered with, let's start authenticating the transaction instead. You know, is this user actually making a legitimate transaction? Should they be wiring $100,000 to Latvia or whatever the case may be? Because it's not so much the user that, that, uh, that matters, it's the transaction. So the banking customers that we interact with in the States, um, they basically decided that they've lost the war for control over the user's desktop they assume that the user's desktop is compromised and how, how do we do business with the user anyway under this scenario. And in per particular countries, uh, uh, one particular large brand tells me everybody in, uh, everybody in Brazil is effectively compromised statistically, which is, and I'm, they probably see enough that it's probably true. So they just go, okay, the user's compromised, now what do we do? And that's just basically how they, they don't even care about the client anymore. Any other questions? 
All right, I'll be around the conference to answer more. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Jeremiah.